Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lauren Speranza, Director for Transatlantic Defense and Security at the Center for European Policy Analysis, or CEPA. Over the last six months, CEPA has been leading a digital campaign in partnership with the US mission to NATO to help the Transatlantic Alliance imagine and prepare for future threats. We've been specifically focused on the future of hybrid warfare, something we hear a lot about these days. Hybrid warfare can mean many things, but at its heart, it involves blending conventional military conflict and non-conventional methods like cyber or disinformation, corruption, and even money to quietly undermine democratic societies and institutions. Now we've been engaging next generation security, tech, and policy voices from across the Alliance to try and think more creatively about how these threats will evolve in the next decade and how we can best get ahead of them. And who better to help us think outside the box than best-selling author of World War Z, Devolution, and many other books, Max Brooks. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Max to try and harness the innovative spirit of the world of science fiction to help militaries and policymakers today. Max will also help us unpack how some of his imagined scenarios have already started to come to life and what we can learn from that. In addition to his work as a novelist, Max is also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and the Modern Warfare Institute at West Point, although his views, of course, are his own. Max, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great. Well, I have a whole bunch of questions from eager listeners in our network who have <clears throat> heard you in advance, so I'll do my best to get through as, as many of them as we can. Um, and I wanted to start with something that's on the top of mind for all of us these days, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, this has really started to open our eyes to new kinds of threats to public safety that we don't traditionally think about as security threats. But you, Max, of course, were way ahead of us in some of your own writing. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what parallels you've seen between some of the fiction you've written and some of the events that have played out as a result of the pandemic, and, and maybe what are some differences? Well, I, I think what I, <clears throat> what, what I was trying to uh, get across with World War Z was that when a crisis happens, that crisis is connected to everything. And I think, unfortunately, for very for too long, we have been slowly divorcing the populations of democratic peoples from the people who protect them. We've been marching towards this sheep and sheepdog model, which has given us a false sense of security. We didn't used to have that. We used to understand uh, in two world wars and even during the Cold War that our safety depended on every aspect of our society, not just the folks with the guns. It depended on how well our infrastructure worked, uh, how well our children were educated, what our nutrition standards were, what our physical fitness standards were, how well we gelled as a society. The Roosevelt administration understood that very, very well. Uh, and our enemies didn't. There, there was a feeling among uh, the dictatorships that attacked us uh, in World War II that since we were a hybrid mongrelized nation of different people stitched together, that all you had to do was kick the door and everything would fall apart and we would all turn on each other. Uh, but we had done such a good job uh, centuries before building this ideal of what it means to be an American that everyone came together. And, and that's particularly true in the United States more so than even our European allies is that the United States really is just a fake country that stands on nothing but who we want to be. And so that is critical uh, that we always want to figure out who we want to be. So when I was talking about World War Z, I wanted to write about how uh, economics contributed to the viral outbreak, politics contributed to it, freedom of the press, uh, an underclass, illegal immigration, uh, everything, pretty much everything can crack. And through those cracks comes the plague. That's so interesting. And I think particularly that's the heart of what we're trying to communicate about the, the types of threats we're seeing today is that they're so holistic, they cut across domains. And um, so that's that's really interesting. But I wanted to pick up on what you mentioned about, um, you know, coming together and, and deciding who we want to be. And I think um, this is something that that is particularly relevant in the transatlantic context because that those shared values and principles is, is what binds up the, the United States and, and like-minded allies and partners through, through NATO, but also um, more broadly. And so I'm curious, 
you know, World War Z kind of touches on how the global community and uh, responds to these types of crisis crises. And I'd be curious how you would rate the the global community's response, maybe not just to the the coronavirus pandemic, but also some of these things, these non traditional threats like information operations and climate right. change that we're we're now witnessing as a as a globe. Well, I, I think that this is something we have to understand that one of my main duties within the Modern War Institute and the the Atlantic Council's Brent Scowcroft Center is to talk about non-military threats before they become military. Because the moment when people pick up guns is the end of the story, not the beginning of the story. And we need to understand this. And some people do. The whole reason that I run in your circles in the first place is because uh, Admiral Weiskup at the Naval War College many years ago read World War Z, brought me in and said, listen, I want you to talk about the connections uh, because war is the end, not the beginning. Uh, and I think we need to understand that a humanitarian crisis can become a military crisis, that an environmental crisis can become a military crisis. Economics becomes a military crisis. The connections are always there. I think we right now, and I, and I say this because I have not heard this on the national level, we are failing at the end of the COVID plague to learn from those connections. Mm -hmm. You know, now I think what we should be talking about is that democracy is critical to public health. Because when I chose my zombie virus to be in, in the People's Republic of China, I didn't do it to, to hit the Chinese people. In fact, I think that the Chinese people are the most innocent in all this. But what I needed was a country that was rapidly modernizing, uh, that was also connecting to the wider world, but most importantly, did not have a free press. It's why I couldn't put my virus say in India or Mexico or someplace like that because one intrepid reporter would blow the story wide open. You needed a government that was willing to censor its own press and therefore let the virus bubble up. And I use the example of SARS, uh, the first SARS, because I thought that's a perfect model for my zombie virus to get out. Uh, and then we saw it happen again. And I think to me, you asked before, what am I most surprised about? You know, I think, I think the most crushing disappointment of this entire pandemic is the West's failure to celebrate Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Because the government of the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party is coming out of this plague with a very strong narrative that autocracy works better at keeping your people safe. Now look, look how well we've done, they say. Look at the hospitals we've built in 10 days. Look at the lockdowns we've enforced. If you wanna talk about physical safety, keeping your children alive, look to us. Well, Taiwan blows that all out of the water because the Republic of China is democratic. It has a free press. It has all the values we in the West claim to cherish and they've done a much better job even than we have. So we should be celebrating them, that democracy works. But we're not doing that because of our own greed, because our corporations don't want to lose their slave labor contracts in mainland China. And I think that's something that we need to come to grips with, that we have been funding this autocracy, this alternative model of capitalism without democracy. And as a result, we're learning the wrong lessons from COVID. Hmm, that's really interesting. I wanna zoom in on this information domain piece that you've highlighted a couple of times here. And I think in terms of how do we alter maybe the West response, one thing that um, one of our viewers asked about was because we are seeing these types of consistent widespread information mm -hmm. campaigns directly targeting you know, the West, transatlantic people and societies and institutions, is there more that we should be doing um, as part of our own concerted media uh, and information effort? You know, not, not of course, orchestrating our own disinformation, but can we use fact and truth um, kind of against these, these threats to, to yes. our advantage? We must, yeah, oh my God, no. Th this, this has been, I think, the largest failure of the West since the end of the Cold War. We used to have uh, a department of truth facts, the press, and our own leaders. And our own leaders were held accountable by that free press that we as citizens paid for. You gotta pay for that. 
to have good journalists who were trained in good journalism schools who could get to the bottom of the story and then hold our leaders accountable. And with the end of the Cold War, with the rise of social media, we have completely given up that responsibility. And, and I've, seen, I've seen the battle lines here. At the Atlantic Council, we literally had someone from a previous administration who is transitioning going to work for a big social media company, kind of the way a general leaves the Pentagon and then goes to work for aerospace. And boy, he was in full throated support of social media companies not having to say or do anything to combat misinformation. And he used this. He said, listen, we're just the carton. We're not responsible for the eggs, which is interesting because I just saw that Q documentary where the QAnon guy literally said, hey, we're just the power company. We're not responsible for how people use the electricity. Wow. Which by the way, that's just greed. We need, we need to stop buying this pseudo philosophical argument about free speech when it comes to our social media companies, because it's simply not true. Our social media companies are today what the auto industry was in the 1960s. They had the very same defense when safety advocates tried to get them to build safer cars. And they said, hey, we're not responsible if you don't know how to drive, all right? We're not gonna take our profits and build safer cars. You become safer drivers. That was their argument. And we said, no, no. If I do everything right and I got hit by another car, it's not okay for my baby to go through the windshield. And we did that, we took them to task. And now when you try to buy a car, what's one of the first things you look at? The safety rating. That's got to be the exact same standard with our social media. We need to hold them accountable and we need them to spend the money because they can. They say things sometimes like, oh, I mean, who can regulate it? They can. In the very same way cars are safe, in the very same way when you build a building, there has to be fire codes. When you have a food product, it has to be tested so people don't put poison in their bodies. It's the same thing. We need to hold them accountable because we are not just voters, we are also customers. And if my social media platform is being used by a foreign country to spread disinformation, which gets my fellow citizens killed, I have the power and the responsibility to say, that's not okay. It's such an interesting question too to think about, you know, to what point can we rely on self-regulation versus, you know, do we need to step in with, with government um, or, or other, you know, societal kind of guidelines. And, and I think that's something we're really seeing play out in front of us today. And one of the things that I think is exacerbating all of this is the, the pace of technological change. And, you know, we, we spend so much time now talking about algorithms and bots and all of the new types of technologies that are feeding into these dynamics, not only in, in the information space, but also more broadly across the future of, of warfare. So, you know, some of your writings touch on this, but, but I think it's this question of, um, you know, do emerging technologies exacerbate the threats or can they help us combat the future threats of tomorrow? Um, so from your perspective, you know, how do you, how do you see, is technology making us more or less secure? I think technology can make us more secure if we make it make us more secure. The problem is, uh, and this happens all the time, whenever there's a technological revolution, it always jumps ahead. And then it's up to the rest of us to catch up and to regulate it. And, and we have to. Uh, if anybody is wondering what a, an unregulated system looks like, look no farther than the Empire State Building, because it was built originally with an aerodrome on top, because it was believed that everybody would eventually commute to work in giant bags of hydrogen before the Hindenburg. We had safety standards. So technology, I think, is a very good thing. One of my friends is Annie Jacobson, who's written a lot about biometrics and about a surveillance state. Well, a sur having sur public surveillance is not inherently bad or good. It's bad when the People's Republic of China uses it to build a trust index among its own people. But with us, we use it to see when our own police officers shoot unarmed civilians, which we didn't have when I was a kid. We had one tape of Rodney King, but now our law enforcement is held accountable to us by technology. So I think the lawyers, the diplomats, the politicians, and most importantly, the journalists and the voters slash taxpayers, we need to catch up. 
uh, I was speaking to someone in Cyber Command uh, about resources, about the great hack, which we all know is coming. There's going to be a great Pearl Harbor 9-11 style hack someday. And he said, we've got the resources. What we don't have is the doctrine on how to effectively divvy up those resources, because we don't. You know, we don't have a code of cyber warfare, and we need that desperately. Uh, because right now, let's say a foreign power or a non-state actor taking sanctuary within a foreign power, typical scenario, um, hijacks data from a hospital, just as a crime, just, just you know, for ransom. But while that data is hijacked, uh, patients don't get their prescriptions filled and they die. Well, that's murder. And isn't that an act of international terrorism? And if that international terrorist who killed citizens is being sanctuary, is having sanctuary in another country, isn't that an act of war? And if that is a NATO ally, isn't that no different than if that foreign power rolled in the tanks? We don't have a treaty for that. And that needs to change. Right. And, and I think that also yeah. raises the question, you know, not only about we, what we do and how we guide our actions, but do you think there's also the risk that if there's not a more proactive effort from, from transatlantic and like-minded allies to kind of set these rules of the road, um, that there's a risk that those practices and, and standards could be set by our adversaries and, and competitors? Yes, I think that, that we must be proactive because our enemies are not gonna wait. And this, this by the way, goes back to the worst war the United States and her allies ever fought, which is Desert Storm. Because we thought, this is what set the pace for the world we're living in right now. That war was supposed to be a war of deterrence. We thought as the Cold War was winding down that if we met another enemy on a sanitized neutral battlefield and utterly pulverized them with our massive overwhelming military might, we would be deterring aggression. We thought we would say to our, our frenemies and our future enemies, don't mess with us. We will destroy you on the battlefield. That's not the lesson they took. The lesson everyone else took from Desert Storm was, okay, if you're going to mess with America and the West, just don't do it on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So we pushed our enemies into asymmetry. And they are a generation ahead of us. Well, we in the West have continued to build up uh, our aircraft carriers and our tanks and our missiles, uh, they've been developing cyber warfare and economic warfare, uh, information warfare, and more importantly than all of that, they've been synchronizing it into doctrine. So they know how to act. We are way behind, much more than we ever were in the days of the space race or any arms race. And we, we must catch up. And I think to do that, we in the Western democracies need to change our view of government versus the private sector. Because we need to understand the basic philosophy that private corporations are good, they generate wealth, they're the best thing we have for ending poverty, but they are accountable only to their shareholders. The reason government regulation is so important is because in a democratic system, the government is accountable to all of us. So a democratically elected government is our best tool for holding everyone else accountable for our safety. Yep. And I think you bring up a very good point about how, you know, all these threats that we're starting to see are, are kind of in this, in this asymmetry that you highlighted, this space where we're not comfortable acting because of all those reasons. And, and I think for an organization like NATO, which is something that we've been focused on, it's really difficult to understand how an organization, a conventional organization like NATO can operate below the, the armed armed conflict threshold or the Article 5 threshold that traditionally kind of signals collective defense. We don't know necessarily what we can do. We don't know how to not be escalatory, but at the same time to make actions that, that, that you know, are warranted based on threats that are being posed against us. So I think that's something we really have to grapple with as a policy community and as militaries um, to understand. And, and building on that, I mean, I think we're doing a lot better now at trying to pick up on some of these trends so that we can start to get ahead of them. But um, what do you see kind of thinking, stepping back as in your creative mind, um, what do you think is the top sort of concerning trend that we're not thinking about or we're not talking about in the policy debates yet? I think honestly, the, the, my, my main concern is the lack of connection 
between the domestic social justice movements in all the Western democracies. The lack of connection between that and the broader great power competition, because they are one in the same. I have yet to hear uh, a grand speech like the Iron Curtain speech or the Day of Infamy speech or Tear Down This Wall or Ich bin ein Berliner. I have yet to hear a grand speech that says to all of us, no matter what democratic country we live in, if you value the human rights that those who came before you fought so hard for and that you're still fighting for, you must understand that that is great power competition because it is a competition of value. It is a competition between one system that allows people the freedom to be who they are and who they want to be versus another system that offers capitalism without democracy. That says you can have all the shiny bling bling you want, but when they take your neighbors away in the middle of the night or they come for your child or they come for your parents, or they come for you, you don't get to say anything. So enjoy your iPhone. There has yet to be this connection that we are in the fight of our lives now. Who do we want to be? Uh, and I think until we do that, that the other side is going to continue to dominate us. Yeah. It's so important that that narrative, but I think it sometimes comes off as this lofty concept, you know, where we're talking about models of governance and ways to organize our society. But it does have very real implications for everyday citizens, you know, not just people that are focused on policy, not just people who are yeah. focused on technology, but but every citizen of a democratic society or or otherwise. And so how how do we, I think these kinds of conversations and through through your your novels and your writings, I think is a great way to start to mm -hmm. try relating these things to to average citizens. But do you have you know lessons learned or ideas for how do we better communicate with yeah. our people? I think one of the things we need to understand, certainly at the government or, or the national or global security level, is what it means to diversify your outreach to your influencers. Because this isn't World War II anymore, where Franklin Roosevelt could simply call up Hollywood and say, listen, get me Humphrey Bogart. And then Humphrey Bogart would do a newsreel and say, listen, kids, you got to buy a war bond, war bond, she. And then everybody would say, oh, well, Bogart said, buy war bonds. Okay. It doesn't work that way. And this is a conversation mm -hmm. we've had in the public health sector for some time. Who do people trust? So I've talked from everyone to the Blue Ribbon Biodefense Panel to the mayor's office of the city of New York. We are all so split apart. And that's just the way it is. So we need to do the extra work to target the community influencers, no matter who they are. Uh, because you, you got to rebuild trust. And this is actually a conversation I had with SOCOM, you know, because in the United States, one of the biggest problems we have is getting our tech sector on board. Because the military is over here with a completely insulated culture, the tech sector is over here, and the tech sector thinks that all the military does is, and I quote, I think it was Ilhan Omar, bombing brown people. That's what the people in the tech sector think. And no one from the military has come over. And I said, stop trying to recruit the tech sector. Recruit the recruiters. Go to them. Find someone that these other people trust. And it doesn't matter what they look like, what their identity politics are. But they should say, listen, you know me and you trust me. And you know I stand for social justice and equity and diversity and inclusion. And let me tell you, the countries we're up against, first of all, number one, it's nonviolent. They're not firing a shot. But number two, you don't get to be gay in Russian-occupied Chechnya. You don't get to, be, get to be trans in Iran. You don't get to have women's rights under the Taliban. You don't get to be a thinking human being in the People's Republic of China. And if you want to talk about Islamophobia, just ask Uyghur Muslims who were born different and are now being put in re-education camps. So if you care, if you're marching in the streets for justice for George Floyd, you need to understand that in places like China, Iran, and Russia, that's just called good policing, what they did. So we need to make those connections and the connectors need to be the individuals of community that have already earned their trust. Hmm. 
It's a really powerful message. Um, well, I wanted to just wrap with with one last question that kind of brings us back to to where we started. You've spent a lot of time, as you've alluded to, working with militaries and policymakers to try to get them to think more creatively about how to prepare for future threats. Um, and I, I just wondered if you kind of had one piece of advice that you would offer to help them more effectively harness some of the, the ideas that, that we've been teasing out through, through fiction and futurism. Um, if there's one kind of recommendation that things that you would wish that they would do, um, what yes. would that be? I will say that I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the creative process. Um, we, had, we had an Atlantic Council talk once about how to be more creative within uh, national security circles. And it was me. Uh, and then there was a guy who was very big in the video game world, much richer and more successful than me. So he must be smarter. But he said, he said, I'm, he said, you know, I think the problem is that it's not enough creative people. So I think what you've got to do is bring in the creative people. You know, and they would come in and they'd bring their good ideas in. And then those creative ideas would sort of flow out into the system. And I know I sound like Alfred from the Batman movies, but maybe him <laughs> and the Geico gecko, but that's kind of how we talk. And once again, super brilliant guy who might have criticized him, but I can tell you that that's wrong on two levels. <clears throat> Number one, the Bush administration tried that right after 9-11. They brought in all these Hollywood screenwriters to give them these brilliant ideas. It didn't work. Second, I've spent enough time in the in military circles, certainly military circles, to understand that the ideas are there. I've, I've heard more creative ideas from a group of Marines than I have from any group of Hollywood screenwriters. The problem is the misunderstanding of the creative process. It's not that the ideas aren't there, it's that they don't have champions. Hmm. Because what you need is a long chain of events. First link in the chain is the idea. Ding, I have a dream. But how do you make the dream come true? Well, then you need other people who understand how to get through the department of no. Because there's always a department of no. Same thing in Hollywood, it's everywhere. So you need people who will be able to champion your idea and break through the department of no. That I think is the most important link in the chain. And what I have lectured to at cadets at West Point is that you don't have to be a creative person yourself. You just have to recognize those ideas and you have to stick your neck out because not just in the military, but in government circles, uh, you make one mistake, you make a fool of yourself, you take a risk, 30 years of your career could be over and that needs to change. There needs to be uh, more of an understanding of courage under pressure as well as courage under fire. And we need to find those champions. That's that's really um, really insightful. So thank you for that, and and we're gonna try to be some of those champions on the outside, and we work with a lot of a lot of folks on the inside too. So we're looking forward to continuing to help inspire that kind of change and that kind of thinking and and taking that forward. But you've been very generous with your time, so thank you so much, uh, Max, for all of your insights. Um, really important to have these kind of diverse and candid conversations, I think, to challenge our assumptions, really make us think. So thank you for doing just that um, on behalf of SIPA. And thanks to all of our listeners for all the great questions. Um, we, we look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Thank you. Thank you.